Hey, it's Laura. If you're listening to this, you're not hearing the complete unedited version of this conversation. If you want in on that, you can get it by becoming a TMST Plus member. Just head over to our website at tmstpod.com and click support. All right, enjoy the show. Hello, hello, Laura here. Oh man, today's guest has been one of the most requested interviews even before our first episode aired. Rob Bell entered my life sometime around 2013 or 14 when I was really, really seeking at the end of my drinking and the beginning of what I knew was a significant becoming for me into something else. I knew I wanted to be a writer. I knew in some sense that I was a writer. And I had started to claim that calling and put words down and even to share them, but it was all still so new and tender and shaky. I think I saw a video of him giving a talk about everything is spiritual, and that next week he happened to be coming to Boston right after I saw that video. So I bought a ticket and I went to see him talk and had one of those experiences at the House of Blues where my whole body lit up in recognition. I just, I wanted what he had. Since then, he's been a consistent teacher of mine and someone I find myself going back to time and again to get grounding and clarity and that unique energy that only Rob has. He just has one of the most pure, electric, inspiring and infectious energies for life. He's truly engaged in the mystery and is such a model for doing things your own way. In a time of quote unquote influencers, cheap fixes, social media narcissism, hustle culture, self-improvement by meme, and increasingly shallow teachers, he is a rare example of someone who actually walks the talk. He's far more interested in remaining curious than appearing to have all the answers, and I love that about him. So this isn't the first time I interviewed Rob. We had him on twice on home podcasts, but this felt entirely different because those interviews were in many ways a lifetime ago. I've learned so much since then and have solidly situated myself in that dream I was just starting to let myself imagine back when I first stumbled upon him in 2013. In some ways, I'm even more of a student than I was then. It's just the questions are different. In the decades since Rob has emerged as a pastor, he has patiently, persistently been engaged in a project of hope, inclusion, and a desire to bring a calming clarity to the world. He is the New York Times bestselling author of 11 books, including Love Wins, Everything is Spiritual, and Drops Like Stars. He's toured with Oprah, been featured in The New Yorker, and in 2011 was named one of the most 100 influential people by Time Magazine. His podcast, The Robcast, is one of my consistent go-tos. This conversation came to me at exactly the right time, and I have a feeling it might have that effect on you too. We dig into big themes like contentment, airtight integrity, the stories we tell ourselves, and questions like, am I in the right place? Am I living how I want to live? Is there any joy in what I'm doing? I hope you enjoy this time with Rob Bell. I was thinking about all the potential things that I could maybe talk to you about. And I rewatched Heretic. You talk about, you went through, you had this, you know, sort of big world. And then in 2011, Love Wins comes out and things change. And you talk about, you know, going from speaking to crowds of 1500 to like 50 people sometimes. You talk in one point about this gratitude that you feel. And it's very like, you can hear it sort of crackling when you're talking that it's coming up in you, this gratitude. And 
to me, it's humility. There's like a lot of humility in that. So I wanted to ask you, what have you learned about humility in the past <laughs> 10 years? <laughs> well, I, uh, I think when I stumbled into the image of being a student, I didn't do that well in school. I found it very constrictive and not that imaginative. So it's odd that academics and academia were never that compelling to me. But after that, the idea of being a student truly captivated me. So, and even in, like, when I was, I, I got trained as a pastor and I went to seminary and did all that. And it, it was the Jesus having students, disciples, that was the thing that I like. It was almost like the tuning fork. It was like the no, that's like, oh, I could be a student. Like, <laughs> because <laughs> that had this element of curiosity and wonder, and you didn't expect to have it all figured out. There's like a number of assumptions and expectations just built into that one image of a student. I think, honestly, at some point, Laura, early on, that just became like the lens. So it's interesting when you interact with somebody within a couple of minutes, or if you ask a few questions, you can quite quickly figure out a person's lens. Yeah. Some people just wear it like a name tag, you know, like achieve <laughs> achievement is pretty much my deal. Um, you know what I mean? Like sometimes some of them just, you can see them coming. You're like, oh yeah, that. Oh yeah. Right, 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 right. The neon green Lamborghini in my neighborhood. <laughs> Got it. You know what I mean? Like the lens is yeah. fairly straightforward. But mm -hmm. the student, humility is, is like baked into that. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to me how the person who charges into the building and grabs the people when it's on fire and comes out, when they interview her about her heroic deed, she never uses words like courage or bravery. She's like, I just ran into the building. That all the words that everybody wants to be, the people who embody those words never use those words because it was just called Tuesday. So there is something in that moment. I don't know if you remember the moment I'm talking about in, in the movie where you are talking, you're in the back of a car and you just say, you recount how there there were people, there were lots oh, yeah, of people yeah, yeah. and then there were no people. Yeah. And then you just, there's this moment where you say, yeah, I'm just, the, the gratitude is so big and you just, it sort of stops there. So I started doing club and theater tours in 2006. The venues kept getting bigger. I mean, like solid. I was like doing the rooms that my favorite bands do. It was that like, whoa. And then Love Wins came out in 2011. And that fall I did a club and theater tour. And I, I'll never forget the booking agent saying, yeah, tickets aren't selling that well. And then, I mean, I would go to a town where I, where last time I was there, it sold out with a thousand people, 1200 people. And I'd walk out on stage and there'd be 50 people uh, huddled in the middle of this cavernous theater. And a friend of mine, I remember saying, dude, you lost your audience. I had, I had to make peace with, maybe you had your moment and now the rest of your life, you'll just quietly sort of fade and you'll have your life with your family. You'll go surfing. You'll figure out something else to do. Kristen and I had this running joke from Spinal Tap. Maybe I'd sell shoes. Are you, I think you're at 11. Um, so I had to go through all that. That was the fall of 2011. I just didn't remember that. It took a while. It was like a death. So now it's six years later. And there's like people buying a ticket to sit on the floor. <laughs> when it's literally standing room only. I... I have a, a level of gratitude.
What was going on? What is that? My dad used to say the greatest, when I was growing up, he had these things that he would repeat over and over. And one of them was he would say, the greatest gift you can give yourself is to love your work. Mm, really? You know, he, he used to Damn. say like, Good he's, like yes. he's like, that's the good best. He's like, he's like I, I've never woken up in the morning and not wanted to go to work. And there's probably a whole world of things there. But it was really interesting. Now he was like, can you imagine getting up in the morning and not wanting to go? Like for him, it was like, what? But that really did something to me. So finding something to do in the world that I loved. Can you believe we get to do this? That can even when it broke your heart. And then you just keep it also. That, I mean, that movie is one like I had zero. Obviously, I had zero edit or control over that movie because that was part of the interesting experiment for Kristen. And I was just to let somebody make whatever they wanted to make. And I absolutely adore Andrew, the filmmaker, but that was like his a lent. That's a way you could tell a portion of a sure. story. Yeah. But people not appreciating my work, that's probably a, there'd been a solid decade of that before mm-hmm. that film. So that actually, none of that was ever that interesting because it was, it had varying degrees of volume. Yeah. <laughs> but otherwise <laughs> there, that was just like refrigerator buzz. If you're quiet enough, you can hear it in the corner. But that was never what was interesting. What was interesting was the exploration and the learning and stretching and the transcendence and the unexpected surprise. Like that was always where all the life was. So, yeah, that particular period, like that sort of moment of, oh, this might really change going forward. It still was all like an evolution in a particular direction. So you just keep coming back to, can you believe we get to do this? I mean, a couple nights ago in Portland, the first night of this new tour, and this new tour is like, I haven't done anything like this before. And just going out and trying it. And I was... What, wait, say that. What do you mean? What's new, what's new about it? Oh, you'll have to see it. <laughs> but, You're not coming here. Uh, oh, how do you know? know? How to give me a cup? Give me some time. All right. <laughs> Just me all alone on a stage talking for two hours has been how it's been for about thirty years, and through at the end of the last tour, I was like, "God, this is the end of this is the end of this tour, but it's also the end of something. It's end of something. A whole way of thinking about this." And I had been trying some things that involve the people who are there creating the show with me in the moment that I had been trying a couple things. It was like, well, what if you took this farther? What if you really, what if I didn't know where things were going next? What if all the musculature you build up, you set aside and we all had an, so that's some of the questions that led to this. And there's like the, well, what if you tried that? And then it all feels like all of the, years of learning and growing and and then there's this moment and this thing I'm trying (laughs) so I just go back to your question you're trying something it could work it could not you're more alive than ever yeah that's that's what we all want that's what everybody wants it is what everybody wants you want wonder and awe about your own existence so all this other like all those things that people talk about with success so that's fine I guess but No, you want to wake up in the morning and have a sense of, we get to do this? Yeah. (laughs) That's actually what everybody wants. It is. It's not what gets sold. But that's why the show is, the whole line for the show is for people who want to fall in love with the mystery of life again. Yes. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And I know that feeling too. So what, okay, so, so this leads me into something else. I've been, one of the questions that's been rolling around in me a lot in the past year, two years is, and just came and then it just kept coming is what is enough? Like, what is enough success? What are enough followers? What's enough money? What's enough house? What are enough, you know, friendships? Like, what is enough? Because I... You've had a strong lens that, you know, you talk about the lens that was sort of on you. I've tried on some different lenses, you know, and one of those 
I, I have a proclivity towards chasing more. Mm -hmm. And I reached a point where I was, I realized I was like on the treadmill. I was just, I was just on a treadmill and, and this more treadmill. And so I started battling with this question of what is enough and that's sort of where I've been sitting. And so I, I have a question about contentment, I guess, and I can't think of a better word. Maybe we can come up with a better word. That's a good, no, it's a great word. Contentment, feeling like you really do have, a, you, you have enough and you are enough and, and that tension between that and, and sort of striving and trying, because as you said, like a lot of people, what they want is to feel enraptured in this mystery to have meaning, I think. And that requires effort. A lot of times you find your, yourself squarely in a place where that is not your existence. You, you're not there. You're somewhere else. I knew when I, in 2012, when I had to get sober, like I had not lived into potential that I knew was there. And that was a, the alcohol was killing me, but it was a deep spiritual death. Like that was really killing me. So I had to, to effort and strive. And so I'm, I'm wondering about that tension between, it seems like you don't struggle with that. Like this sort of striving oh. versus contentment. Oh, God, these are the questions. Yeah. These are, oh no, this ambition, drive, peace. Oh, these are the questions. So yeah. Yeah. actually, if a person doesn't have these questions, that's actually where the problems are. Like, like you have a gift you want to give. Mm -hmm. You want to help. So of course, you would ask questions like, I really enjoy doing this. Could I do this more? Is there anybody else I could help? Of course. So, if, so notice how it sits within you. If it sits within you as anxiety, so for most people, any tension is something to be eliminated as yeah. opposed to tension as a sign of life. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple things on the front end, such as, is this sustainable? That's one of the first questions to ask about all of this is the person who's pushing, it's only sustainable if it's for a chapter, but if it's just endless into the future, that's what kills a person. Is it just this, pushing as hard as possible? And like here in Los Angeles, the uh, addiction to being noticed and fame and such. Yeah. It's everywhere, but here it takes on almost cartoonish proportions. The people who everybody sees and hears and knows and follows and talks about, what those folks do to stay on your radar is completely insane. Have you ever been hooked by it at all? What a great question. I have had at different times people around me who said the kind of things about what's possible that you're like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and you get starry-eyed. I would, yeah, I, I like assume. It could be bigger. Type no one's type. ever asked me that. That's a really good question. No one's ever asked me that. Yeah, yeah, probably. But I had a series of experiences that broke me of it. And I watched a couple of people I'm close to ride that rocket to the sun. And I saw, I was given a front row seat to, to all of what I wanted without it being me. And saw, oh my God, there's a whole thing. And, and actually, some of my own experiences was like that. It wasn't fun. Okay, so here's an example. All the best to all the publicists out there, but a publicist is pitching you all the time. Yeah. Trying to get somebody to notice you. So they're standing in the street tossing pebbles, and I have had wonderful publicists. But the premise, so, so that, that said... The premise is somebody somewhere is trying to get you in front of people. So that's a particular energetic imprint. And at least in what I do, if you, Laura, go to get help from the guru who's up in the cave, up on, you climb up the mountain and you go into the cave 
and you say to the guru, hello, I need some help. And the guru says to me, great, but first, could you help me get more Instagram followers? You're like, crap, I got go, I to I gotta go higher up the mountain. Yeah, This guru can't help me. So what happened to me, oh, Laura, so is the machinery and my encounter and experiences of that machinery were directly diametrically opposed to the actual spaces I'm trying to create for people, which are spaces that are free from that. Yeah. So I can't help you if I'm actually thinking about Instagram. And Kristen and I really, really, this, this for us, which is why I love it that you asked, and people don't often ask, we lived here in West Hollywood, what, seven years, has been flushing all of that out of the system almost like defiantly off the grid build it ourselves just quietly go about doing the work what does that look like i'm so i'm so curious about this question it looks like talking to you because i know talking to you will be exactly the kind of interaction that we're here to have as opposed to how can i get my, I just don't ever, all I ever think about are interactions with people like you and what's the next thing to make. Instead of say, choose the opportunity where you don't even, you, you don't even feel aligned with anything someone's about, oh, yeah. but they have, but they have 500,000 uh, know, people. It, that that's it. That's it. That's the one, that's one of the things I would say 10 years ago, Hey, do this and this will put you in front of all these new people. So that would be an example where that, Oh, really? And now I like, uh, I got this, my next play and here's like a stack of three by five cards with the first, it would be the fourth play. And here's a stack of cards of the first scenes that are coming to me. And then here's, um, like a couple of scraps of paper with like the next things I'm working on just a couple of ideas and then here's where a couple of the ideas are made more are like actually arranged and sequenced like that's where yeah. that's the joy <laughs> yeah yeah that's I, the and joy. I, th- so that <laughs> when i started talking about humility like that's i can tell who my my teachers are my over time because i go back to them over time like i'll there's some people i've been like oh i need you know they're the the angry voice and the loud oh, voice. sure sure that's well said yeah and uh and it's very enticing and seductive and like uh, you know and then and it, and it burns out um but i over the years have gone back to your work again and again and again and and that to me is is indicative of all of the the people i would consider teachers and it is that aspect about you that reminds me continually to get grounded in what it is I'm chasing and what it is I'm not chasing. The whole South Star thing was like, oh my <laughs> God, thank you forever. Thank you forever. Forever. Yeah. So, yeah. so for you, the really interesting thing then for you is anything that has energetic charge you pay attention to. So, so like I've worked with so many people who their question was social media makes me insane, mm-hmm. like a whole buzz, a whole anxiety. And so they're like, I can't do marketing. I hate marketing. I hate promotion. So I always, always, okay. So there's energy there. There's charge there. Okay. So let's use different words. So anything involving social media for me, I just call it informing and inviting. <laughs> so I will spend 10 seconds, maybe sometime this week telling people I'll be in Detroit and Chicago and Columbus next week. It will take 10, maybe 15 seconds. I will inform and invite because there's a free global broadcast platform (laughs) to tell the people who have said, we'd like to know what you're up to, what I'm up to. And I'm not an idiot. Like that's just beyond that. You know what I mean? Like, so for, so for you, I love inviting people to what I'm up to. And I often will say it's more fun when you're there because it is true. It's more fun. Like, (laughs) yes, it is. So, so like you laughing right there, you have to name it how Laura names it. So, you're actually building a whole Laura ecosystem with airtight integrity where everything is how you do it. 
so what I often notice is people will enter into a space and then be like resentful that that space works a particular way. Well, that's business, that's publishing, that's being an entrepreneur. Like that space conventionally works a particular way. So you can challenge the way it works and try to subvert it. That's great. But don't go into a space and then be shocked that it works a particular way. Right. It works the way it, yeah, it's intended yeah. to work. People, people yeah, totally. who are experts in that field are probably going to say something like that. So <laughs> just, you know what I mean? It's almost like just take yeah. the charge on and go, do you want to work in that space? Okay. You're going to be interacting with people like that. You want to yeah. do it on your own. You won't have all that, but you will be able to do it however you want. Like, it's almost like you take all of the electricity out of it and then go, okay, so how do I want to play this? And right. for so many people, if you move it to playing fields, then it becomes like looser and lighter and um, it, it loses that slog feeling and it becomes, well, what do we want to do next? Okay. Yeah. Let's try that. Yeah. No, that's really good. I, I Or you can, you know, you can choose to not participate in anything that you don't want to participate in. Absolutely. So much stuff that I used to be like, going back to your question, so much stuff that used to be like, oh, is now like, nah, get it. Let's, right. No, I got this stack of cards here and I got the next idea and that's (laughs) good times. That's so good. (laughs) So good. It's so good. You just said airtight integrity. It's something I've heard you say a bunch of times. Uh, And I don't know if it's something you've been talking about for a long time, but I didn't pick up on it until maybe the last year or so. Will you talk about it? Well, I've just noticed how many people will talk about what they're doing and they're like throwing up in their mouth as they talk about it, almost conceding. But then, you know, you got to da 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 da. Why? (sighs) Yeah. Why? Well, you know, it's just how it. Why? So there's some way you move in the world. And, and what if, happens, I, I know I, I can speak from my own experience, but what happens when you are throwing up in your mouth when you're trying to do the work you're trying to do? Yeah, then you, I would, I would pause. What, what is this here? What is this? What is this? So as opposed to something that arises to be eliminated, something that arises that is on your side to tell you the truth about something. So for example, is whoever I'm partnered with, do I have alignment here? Mm-hmm. You would not believe how many people I have worked with in these sessions that I do who brought in questions like this. And all that's the, are you aligned with these people? Oh my God, no. No, but I need them or no, but. Right, and, and the, okay, so, no, so notice that. First question, are you aligned? No, I need them. Okay, hold on. Seven billion people on a planet a million cells died each second in your body or your body replaces them. It is a place of wondrous generativity. The, the universe is massively creative. So the moment I need this person, or think about those uh, singing comp shows like American Idol where they interview the person backstage right before they go on and they're like super emotional and they say, and their mom is in the front row who needs whatever this a <laughs> kidney transplant. I'm not, mo- I'm not mocking it, but I am. And, they say, this is my one shot. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting in that moment, and the camera loves that yeah. emotional, slightly desperate, passionate, this is my one shot. That's actually broadcasting lack and scarcity. Mm-hmm. If this is your one shot, that is a warped, constricted view of life that will only bring misery. Yeah. And yet, you think about in school, the first time you were explained that they're gonna, this test will be graded on a curve, and it was like, only a few people will get the A's. Like, we have been conditioned from early on that scarcity is the game. The economic yep. systems, the academic systems, the social constructs Church. are all built on scarcity. So when a person says, yes, but I need them, to do this, in my experience, somewhere deep, deep in the center of the bean, there's like a tiny millimeter needle move from scarcity to abundance, yeah. from 
lack to generativity. And no, you have options. There are other ways. The, the playing field is much, much different. And uh, uh, there are so many of these deep-seated postures that actually shape the whole thing. I see that the most, too, is this locked frame or a pie. Yes. And the, the possibility, you know, it's even just saying things like, I, I finally got to a place where I, I refuse to say I can't afford that. <laughs> because I would, that's all I would ever say. Can't afford that. Can't afford that. Can't afford that. And it's like, just saying, no, I'm going to I'm going to choose not to spend my money on that. Sounds tiny, but I, I paid. I No, massive. I was massive. I was writing about I'm writing my next book and I wrote about I was writing about money in it. And I mean, I was two hundred thousand dollars in debt like seven years ago and I finally paid it off. And it's like, what moment? There was a lot of things in there, but but one of the big ones was like, stop talking like that. Yeah. Yeah. So like words create worlds and, and words hide. Words have all these energetic imprints. One of the things on this new tour I do is I tell the audience, I'm going to say a phrase and don't listen with your mind, listen with your body and tell me how your body reacts to this phrase. Okay. Here's the phrase supposed to. <laughs> and what's fascinating is to watch a, a theater full of people all jolt bodies yeah like like people like people have a visible visceral physical reaction when they're given a, a moment of on um, the phrase supposed to because sounds a, coming out of your mouth <laughs> make your body isn't that fascinating <laughs> yeah yeah so so like when when you ask about airtight integrity just let your body listen to the ways that you are naming who you are and what you're doing and the body knows, like, so then, and then I got to, or people I've heard of said things like, well, and then I'm going to have to write the book. And we all know how difficult that is. <laughs> well, guess what? Guess what writing the book is going to be? Difficult. <laughs> like, we've already decided. Yeah. So um, even your switch with money, this that isn't like a... Man, there's just millions. It's that's not like uh, in religion they call it like a health and wealth that tells you like you can hit. That's not a fake motivational speaker promise or something. That's just making sure that you haven't already shrunk the thing down before you even started. Right. The I was reading this book by Karen Ornay, which is she's a neo-freudian the woman who you never hear about in the young Jungian world of psych psychology because she was a woman at that <laughs> at that time uh she she called it the tyranny of shoulds oh there you go yeah in our house we say we don't should on ourselves yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so and i think you're going to see more and more people waking up to how you frame an experience shapes what the experience even is that fra yeah. framing language and the power of words and how words create worlds. It, you're al we're already seeing people realizing all these whole worlds of things that are hanging out inside of words. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the executive producer of Tell Me Something True, and I co-created the show with Laura. We built TMST and our online community with the hope of creating a sane spot on the internet. We're really passionate about the ad-free nature of this work. Our belief is that this project will work best if we're not hustling to keep advertisers happy, and we keep our attention on you, the TMST community. And this is where you can play a major role. TMST Plus is the membership group that helps to keep this podcast going. Whether it's through a monthly membership or a one-time contribution, TMST Plus members are vital to this experiment. As a TMST Plus member, you get to join Laura for member-only events, send in questions for the guests, hear the complete unedited interviews, and connect with other TMST community members. You know, sometimes... 
we feel like we can't make a difference in the world. With a TMST Plus membership, you can be keeping this space alive and thriving for a one-time gift or for as little as 10 bucks a month. You can find the link in the show description, and then please head over to tmstpod.com right now to support the show. And thanks. So back to this enough, enough, and this striving versus being content, tension, and what does enough do you feel more often than not like you have enough, I have enough, are enough? And what does that look like to you, like both on the outside and the inside? Wide open spaces. I don't rush. I only do, a, I actually only do a few things. And I'm not, this is what I'm doing today, talking to you. <laughs> I only do a few things, and there's, Lots of wide open space and time to be, and I don't rush places, and I don't try to fit things in, and yeah. I'm not busy. So, wow. and I completely reject the idea. If someone says you get this one life, you better do something with it. Get out of my face right now. Get out. That's all. That's all scarcity. It's all an. In, it's all a warped relationship with time, because. It puts all sorts of anxiety on a person that somehow time is supposed to deliver a thing as opposed to just being here. So if you clean up your relationship with time, we're not trying to cram a bunch of things in before we die. We're trying to be here and be healthy and be present and be centered and then ever so gradually we'll have a sense of what's next. Yeah. And then we'll do it and then we'll get the next sense. And as opposed to these tensions about do you want to do more? Do you want to do less? Was that too much? Those are those are signs of life. Do you want to go to another city? Do you want like you're going to write a second book? Okay. Let's write a second book. Is the second book actually not time for like okay. Like, of course, that's all, the, that's all the grit and that's all the back and forth of this incarnation. So as opposed to what's wrong with me, I, you're learning how to be Laura. So, so, so notice how your second book, you learned how in your first book how to write a book, but the second book isn't the first book. You may have to toss everything you learned because the second book might be of a completely, you, and then you, the musculature from the first book is kind of helpful, but then you're also starting all over again you're going to learn all of this. So everything from the past is kind of helpful, but there may be things you did in the first book that actually get in the way of what you're trying to do with the second book. All you can ever do is be present to the second book and see what it wants to be. So if we slow down and we don't need time to deliver certain things to us. So what happened in the Industrial Revolution with the eight-hour workday and with, is that time came to be seen as units that were good to produce things as opposed to time as a con understanding time as a construct of the mind to make sense of things. And it's real. Like we, this was 10 AM today, my time we talked, so that's real. And yet it's also not absolute. So my prediction is that in the next 10 years, you're going to see more and more people realize that the way they've been thinking about time wasn't actually helpful or accurate. You're going to see a, a revolution in how people understand time. I think COVID did a wonderful job of showing people, oh, you can slow it way down. You can take away tons of things. And all that wide open space is actually filled with all sorts of interesting things. Um, you have more people talking about the eternal now. You have more people talking about being present. You have more people talking about meditation. This is all, this is all beautiful, but it's all in some ways detoxifying us from this go do the work and time to two hours of work gets you that much money, gets you that much stuff. Like it's not all a transaction. Um, That's tyranny too. Wow. Yes, yes, exactly. So you can see how these <clears throat> patterns are so deep sort of in the, the neurology of people, you know, their brains have been. Oh, totally. We, it's like, it's so invisible. I mean, we don't even, it's the water. We don't even, it's like, wait, what? 
We don't. Uh, you have to like drag the fish up on the beach and be like, "Hey, that look at that look back at where you just that thing you were just in." Yeah. Yeah. So, I love your question about content. You have something in front of you that takes that you are giving your energies to. It is got all of that lovely mix of challenge and joy you're not bored you're not buried and it's sustainable and whatever it brings you we're like Woo, that took a lot like this past weekend the whole new show the travel all the weird covid stuff like like i'm tired today yeah yeah and i'm talking to you and then my son and i are, i'm gonna go to, over to my son's house then he and I are going to go to Home State, our one of our favorite taco places, and then we're going to listen to some new mixes of songs he's been recording. Then I'm going to go pick my daughter up from school. Like it's going to be the and then I got some other I got an idea for the next Robcast, and um, I'm going to make some notes on that. And then I got this. I'm trying to explain. Uh, I'm trying to say it. I am saying it like it actually is. So, in your question of what's enough, it's, it's wonderful. It's so good, and 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 I can hear people going, "Okay, Rob, I have three kids. I have a job. I have this. I have that. I have that. Yeah. Okay. So you know where I'm going. Like, what do you mean? How how can I do less? I have." How much of this is a, the energy at which you go at the things in front of you and how much right. is it of of the the actual stuff that has right. to get done? Right. There's a whole base level of things, especially somebody who has a job and three kids. There's a whole baseline there. So I would immediately begin with what things do you need to lose? So right now, yeah. so the person who says, well, I got three kids. Okay, so that's what we're doing now. Okay. So what other things, let's do that. Let's do that really well. Gen oftentimes the person's like, but I don't want to miss out on what's interesting yes. about being fully present to the three kids and the work is when you are fully present to that, you will be rescued from the anxiety of thinking you're missing out on anything because you'll want to be nowhere else. So, okay, you got to say that again. So like, what happens I, is people confuse yeah. spirit and form. Spirit is what animates form. So you can be doing the same thing with, okay, the person, I met a woman over the weekend who's writing a novel, and she's like, I have no idea where, it, I have no idea where it's going. And I was like, how about you try saying that sentence like it's the greatest thing ever. She goes, I'm writing a novel, and I have no idea where it's going. So she said the exact same sentence twice, but they had massively different animating energies. So the person who's like, but I have all these things I'm doing. Okay. Um, do you have to be doing all those? So let's first off, let's just chuck. Let's give away all the clothes you don't wear. Let's clean out all your closets of the stuff you don't use. So in my experience, so many people have so many layers of clutter. Yeah, There's just same. so much stuff and duty and obligation and assumptions like, and then all my kids need to be in sports. No, they don't. Right. Maybe they need to go home, go to school, and then just come home. Yeah. <laughs> like like right. the number of assumptions about what modern life demands. I, I get the sense from you that you have, this is a built-in part of who you are, but it takes a subversive stance for a lot of people to say, uh, I'm not participating in that because there's so much noise, there's so much pressure. There's so much, you know, the other moms and the other parents and the other people and the, you know, and just not saying that you're busy, just not always reflexively saying, oh, we're so busy. We're oh. so busy. Just deciding not to be busy. So what happened early on is my wife, Kristen, was never impressed with volume of activity. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> so she was never in, so she would, so early on, she would say things like, I mean, that's why I started writing books when, as I had these ideas and I was like, I think this is a book. And she's like, imagine all those 10 things that you want to do. 
It's like, imagine if you didn't do the 10 things, you said no to seven or eight of them, and you only did two things, but those two or three things contained the presence and energy of the 10 things. She's like, it would probably actually be way more satisfying. So I often, people will say like, their question will be, I just have so many ideas. I'm just, and they'll mention this thing, this, the Enneagram, they'll be like, I'm a seven, I have so many ideas. And I'll be like, tell you what, try this, try this. Try doing one of them yeah. and finishing it. Yeah, completely. Otherwise, the person's just all over the planet sliding across the surface of things. They're here, they're here, they're here, they're here. So slow down. And a friend of mine was, he's so awesome. He's so wonderfully social. And just the other night, he was like, Yeah, it's like we've had people over the past three nights for dinner. It was just exhausting. I was like, But you love it. He said, Yeah. He's like, But you're telling me it's exact. Yeah. Well, what if you didn't? Just, just, it'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And he brought it up. So, you're right, right. Uh, there is something about the things that get planted in our head about expectations and assumptions about how this is supposed to go. And my experience has been whenever you are poking those and questioning those, generally most movements into greater and peace and contentment come when you become aware of an assumption that was so close you couldn't even see it. It was just, yes. well, this is what we do. And then there's this moment, and generally the like the psychosomatic experience of the moment is, duh. Like, I can't believe I didn't see that. The person generally is like, oh, I don't have to put my kids in that thing. And they're like, how they they almost judge themselves for how simple it was, but that's, it's okay. It's okay. We're yeah. so profoundly conditioned. Just take it easy on yourself. Yeah. But the yeah. moment when the person realizes, oh, that's an assumption. So if you and I went to the local park and we listened in on the parents, within a couple of minutes, we would be able to spot the center of gravity. Mm -hmm. What's expected? What are the norms? What are the standards that everybody has agreed are how it's done. So it's, consciousness always finds a center of gravity of some sort. And most steps into greater freedom, peace, and contentment come when a person spots one of those they've been living according to that they don't need to. It was actually just something that was constructed. This was actually, and I can't believe I'm saying this, this was the underbelly gift of the previous presidency is one of the gifts that president gave in his, I don't even know what the word is, in, yeah. insanity, is he showed how malleable things are. The, Correct. It's, the clay is actually way softer than anybody realized. You could actually, with zero experience, completely hijacked and co-opt an entire political party in a system that has two of them. One of the mind-bending things is this person just kept showing how things that everybody took to be solid ground and just the substructure of things is actually very bendy and malleable. So and everyone's life is like that. Everyone's yes, life. Yes, yes, yes. No yes, one's exempt yes. from that. So the person you're going back to your question, the person is like, yeah, but I, but that thing you're describing, but I have this many kids. I have this many. I, I would just immediately start asking questions about where is it more malleable than you realize, and yeah. we will find spaces. And all you need is a couple of things because you can't. We actually can't handle that much transformation at once. That's why. Yeah. The long, slow arc of evolution, you, a couple steps forward, a step back. Like we think, mm -hmm. by the way, can I tell you that I would argue that cancel culture, for all of its good calling out things, the reason why it often seems to own goal itself and shoot itself in the foot mm -hmm. is because the loudest people haven't made peace with their own evolution. They haven't made peace 
with the long, slow march of their own evolution. So they go hunting for the histories of others. I can't... I'm going to need a minute with that one. That when you see that, it's not just speaking truth, but it is a harsh, almost knee-jerk jumpiness to crush others yep. because they're not enlightened enough, forward enough, whatever enough. Sometimes you can sense the energy. The energy is just so clearly... Now, let's talk about your own story. Let's go back through your own story and make peace with yeah. all of your own story first. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of truth in that. If what you're saying is it's it's easier, it's it's too uncomfortable to to stay in what you're doing, what it is hap what's happening within you. It's a lot easier to go, but you, but you, but this. Yes. Every once in a while what you when you're like, "Wait, what is that? What is off? What you can see people going, "Wait, that seems like what is off there?" Probably what is off there is a person's peace with their own unfolding trajectory. Yeah. And when there isn't peace there, then you have to go hunting. And it's too easy. It's it's so easy. Much it's, easier. It's, Much easier. Yeah. Much easier. So the whole thing is more malleable than we often realize. And you go hunting for all the places where a person was like, no, this is how it works. And it's like, mm, are you sure? Are you sure? And those are the moments of, oh, Oh, the little jail breaks. The jail breaks. Little jail breaks. That's a that's a good podcast title. Yeah, it's because it, they are. Those are those. A lot, you have a lot of them as a parent, or I have. You don't have to participate in that that group, that mom group, or whatever. You don't. I don't. I don't have to do that. I, my daughter doesn't have to have you know fourteen friends. My daughter doesn't have to. We don't have to bring gifts to parties. <laughs> we don't have to have a birthday party. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you're so true. You are so right. There are so, your kid comes along and is like, if you're really paying attention to your kid, the only, how's my kid doing? Oh, your kid's fine. Okay. What, what do they, what do they need here? Well, it appears <laughs> they need that and that. Okay. That's it. like, Whatever I had in my head about what it was, the only interesting game to be playing here is just to be with them and listen. Right. Just pay attention. <laughs> well, it should, this whole year showed so much of that because it's like, oh, wait, we don't, we don't have to go to work. We don't have to go to work to work. We don't, <laughs> we, we don't have to, you know, the, 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 there's so much just in that yep. that broke. And now it's like, how many people, what's the 80% or something of people are supposedly want to change jobs? What are they calling it? The great yeah. res resignation, you know? It's like, yeah, yeah. All this new data of people going, I'm not, I'm just not going to do that anymore. Yeah. The, no, <laughs> hard pass. No. <laughs> yeah. A lot of it is, is malleable is a great word. I'm going to. I'm going to use that. So much of what we're talking about, there's this center, the center of it is sort of possibility and abundance. Back to that, just versus, versus scarcity, versus a locked system. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so it's always ultimately, because everything is spiritual, there always be these undertone, these animating energies that are actually just below the surface that are shaping everything. Mm -hmm. And so whenever the form, whenever the job, whenever the schedule, whenever the the body, whenever it's like, ah, something's off here. Okay, slow down, get quiet, follow it. Um, where does this come from? What is it? Oh, and that's that's when you start seeing. But you have to have the space and... Yeah, that's how it happens. There's one thing I want to just return to real quick about what you said. If you were, if you're paying attention, if you're really paying attention to your two kids or your three kids or whatever, you know, and you wouldn't have the anxiety about the, all the things that are not happening. Yeah. There's a, a distorted, well, I think this is all related to this space, this idea of spaciousness and time and 
things unfolding. You know, I, I at, at seven years sober, I was kind of laughing this morning as I was thinking, you know, I thought when I got sober, like first year, I'm going to publish my book and I'm going to, you know, get out of debt and I'm going to find a new boyfriend and I, I, all these things. And it's like, oh, oh, Laura, like it I'm so glad that all didn't happen. I would have exploded. None of that. I wouldn't have been able to appreciate it. It would have been crazy. None of that. Like, I, I do appreciate the evolution of time and where where I am now is the right thing that, that that is. But a lot of people struggle against that hard. Like, I should know better now. I'm this age. This should have happened. Oh, wow. I've been thinking about this a, a lot recently, how it's interesting you say that. We create a template and then judge ourselves by this, whether or not we're, we've reached it or not, where we're at. When we created, we created, we're the judge and the... the yeah. We don't think we created it, though. It's like, yeah. oh, we did. Yeah, we take it as 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 just the way things are, as the truth, as the the markers. Right. Right. And that's not that's just not that interesting. It's interesting what we said about kids. The great American architect Louis Kahn, before he would design a building, would ask, What does this building want to be? <laughs> I love that. So like with the kid, who does this kid want to be? It's the only interesting question. How can we help? What space does this kid need? Like even our three what a different kids question. just listening. Who does this kid want to be? Oh, interesting. Excellent. Let's pay attention. Let, okay, then let's uh, follow that. See where it goes. Yeah, that's an entirely different life. Yeah, and it begins with the assumption that there's an impelling force. There's a force coming up from within the kid as opposed to mm -hmm. needing the parent to like place a whole thing on top of the kid. You're listening for what's arising from within. Yeah. What does the kid naturally move? What are the patterns? What are the things they like to talk about? Where do they seem to be drawn? How do they like you're seeing what's in there? Yeah. Curious about what's in there. Yeah. Instead of what needs to happen, what right. needs to be. Right. That's awesome. I want to. I want to make sure we're not. I don't know how long you plan to sit here, but <laughs> you've got to have at least another question on your notes, there, right? I have lots of questions. Let's yeah. do two more. Okay. I've been thinking a lot about how, even just at the beginning of my my childhood, or even in my twenties. I mean, I I graduated college without a cell phone. There was no social media. It really was an entirely different world. And it feels like the, in the past hundred years, the way that we live is, is truly entirely different. We've had several revolutions in there. And I feel a lot that we're in a, th a thing right now. We're in like this, we're in a moment, like a big spiritual, like you can hear this death rattle almost of, old ways of being. It feels like polarization, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. And, and, and you can feel that in, as something that's just horrifying and terrifying and just doom and we're all just screwed and there's no hope. But if it's a death rattle <laughs> and if death is the end of something and the beginning of something else, does that feel true to you? For sure, absolutely, and you could you could argue that very coherently from history, and that doesn't mean that the train isn't coming off the rails. But mm -hmm. so, for example, think about what happened when someone realized that you could take sand and out of it you could make glass, and someone else realized you could take glass and put two pieces of glass in a tube, and you could look through it and you could study the stars. And then somebody else discovered, oh, wait, the entire medieval world is built on a belief that the Earth is the center of the solar system. So 
it wasn't just a belief about cosmology, the earth is a center and everything orbits around the earth, but that very nice, neat order then meant you had God, the angels, kings, landowners, slaves, like there was an entire order to what it meant to be a human being all the way from where you fit in the order all the way to where the earth fits with the other planets. And then somebody takes sand, makes glass, puts glass in a tube and says, actually, it's not how it is. It's <laughs> actually the earth is like just another ball orbiting the sun. And <laughs> these massive institutions like the church fought this. And I mean... If you, imagine your brain. Yeah. Imagine no. the upheaval of these ideas. The earth is not the center. The entire order of the world isn't what we were told. But then, in a fairly narrow window from roughly the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s, Human beings had slaves forever, and then in this one narrow, hundred-ish year window, you're nodding because you know exactly where I'm headed, slavery gets pretty much out loud everywhere on the planet. Yep. So you had, even think about people's neural pathways, like, wait, the earth isn't the, like, can you imagine what the, how much that would hurt your brain? <laughs> Yeah, that kind no. of upheaval. And then within a couple of hundred years, you have things like slavery, you have the birth of democracy, as we know it. So historically, things happen that are massively disruptive, people mm -hmm. die, power structures are assaulted and crumble. And, mm -hmm. and it's disorienting at the deepest levels. And then out of it, new things emerge that just become how everybody... Yeah, and so I would argue that, that, right, that for a number of people, you take something like capitalism, etc. Those are arrangements. Like, how are we arranged? How does the public school system work? That's an arrangement. How do businesses think about their relationship to the earth and environmental sustainability? Those are all, could you could call them arrangements, but they're also actually trajectories and they go somewhere. Yeah. So I think you're noticing that people are like, some of the ways that our economy is set up, that isn't just an economic model that we happen to think is the best one. It all also it goes somewhere. And if you keep doing that, if you keep making sure those people's taxes are that and those people's taxes are that, it actually goes somewhere. You yeah. know what I mean? It's actually a story yeah. as well as an arrangement. And a number of these arrangements are actually beginning, the story is actually getting to get really, really dark. And, yep. and it's actually hurting a whole number of people. And so, yeah. And like, I think I'm going to write a book about this next thing that apocalypse doesn't mean an ending. It means a disclosure or apocalypse means to be laid bare. You know, when people say this feels apocalyptic, I think mm -hmm. people generally say that to mean it feels like everything's ending. It's like, no, no, no. Things are being revealed for, for what they truly are. And that's why this moment yeah. is so interesting is it's, it's actually genuinely apocalyptic. Like we knew that there were a group of people who don't want, a whole other group of people in our country to vote. Because when those people vote, then those people lose their power. But they're now actually passing restrictive voting laws. So what we used to sense and kind of know is now actually just being brought out. And so it's the worst thing ever, but it actually almost has to be brought out like it has that. To. That's I mean, I, you, what we're living yeah. through. Yeah. And I think to me that's this is helpful. It's hopeful. That's it's why apocalypse always has an element of hope to it. If you see the larger trajectory, then when it's apocalyptic, Kristen and I call it apocalyptic hope. It's a hope, yeah. but an earned hope because it's like, God, this is the worst thing ever. People are genuinely being crushed. We're not minimizing any of that. 
but it's how you actually get to a new world. Right. It's, it's necessary. Yeah, and even, yeah, and, it's, 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 and at times it can be very difficult to talk about because it sounds like you're minimizing the struggle or the pain of somebody, but we're actually just looking at larger patterns of how the whole thing actually does move forward. And it happens when the, it's, my one son calls it the great unmasking. <laughs> something, <laughs> something somewhere needed to be unmasked. You needed to see just, who had their hands on the levers. You needed to see where the money was going, where the money was coming from. You needed right. to see what that person's motives were because otherwise it all just sat below the surface and it was allowed to keep going. Yeah, it feels like that way to me too. And, and that wasn't intended for people who were listening. Like I, 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 whenever I feel a lot of despair, which I left social media for for the time being because it, it would put me in that place. Yeah. I zoom out. I read some history. Ah, yes. Oh, I like what you said. Zoom out. I very much relate to that. Zoom out. That is a great way to put it. Zoom out. I I love biographies and autobiographies. I love to read about somebody who had an idea and Mm -hmm. followed it and just kept following it. That, that to me, I just couldn't enjoy. I mean, that's just so enjoyable. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So let's, so I, that was one thing I wanted to ask you and, and we can end there is like, who are your teachers or who do you, what do you lean on? Who do you, wh- who or what do you end up going back to, to get back to your center? There's generally a book laying around. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but that, you joke, but that's like, I want to actually hear that, you know, um, there is a, uh, Honestly, Laura, for I don't know how many years, a teacher, somebody always showed up mm. with whatever would help. Yeah. And it's okay. so, when I look back, there was always somebody who showed up at just the perfect moment and had the next thing. So... Some I just got a book for a. There's a bookstore in Ojai where the outside of the bookstore is all bookshelves all the time. Like, <laughs> and all those books are a dollar. And I came across this Zen master named Joko, who her writing just instantly captivated me. Or my son the other day. A couple months ago, I was like, hey, I, this book of yours, somehow I got it, but here you can have it back. And he handed me a book I'd never seen before. And I was like, I don't know where this came from. He's like, I don't know where it came from. This Danish seafaring novel by Karsten Jensen about a tiny <sighs> coastal Danish town. And something about that novel just did something to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> just I totally know what you mean. Did yeah. something... I, this is quite even difficult to put into words. Or there is a an Irish writer named Tana French who writes these. Oh, yeah, oh right? See, God. there you go. I yes. don't know why I finished a book of hers last night. The Searcher? I just finished the third in the series, Faithful Place. Mm-hmm. I don't know why her writing right now. There's something about how she portrays the interior, how the interior life of her narrator processes the story that just always somebody who has something i i yeah. stopped trying to make direct almost like pins and yarn on the wall like to, to connect i stopped trying to figure out why certain things strike me and help and heal and do all you know what i mean you know what i'm talking about absolutely i just something about it speaks at some deeper level and then you just receive it and <laughs> trust what comes. I, yeah. I totally get it. And w- w- words, books are usually where I find the next, the next thing, a, a poem or a ton of French. When I read her, it was the searchers, but the first one I read and I thought, how, <laughs> 
is this? Yeah, right, right, right. You, the mind behind it becomes terribly intriguing. Who is this oh, person? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It does. I, it's very. It's very interesting to me how you you get what you need when you need it. So you you're. I'm moving a half step slower. Mm. I actually have come to see. I think moving a half step slower is a better way to be. I think there's a whole world when you're moving a half step slower that opens up. I mean it. There's a whole world of pain and people. Uh, you you see. You experience and feel people's pain more, so it's not like it's all good. Because suddenly no. you you hear some. But when you're moving a half step slower, you just see. Yeah, you see way more. You see how everything's revved up. You see what's empty. You see people running through the. You see all the wonder more. You see all of it, but you have all to move slower. Do less and move slower, and in my experience, you'll get more done but it will be the kinds of things you actually wanted to be doing. Well, it was so lovely to spend a little time with you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Great questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you want more TMST, head on over to tmstpod.com and become a member. Members get access to the full uncut versions of these conversations, previews of upcoming guests, invites to join me for members only events and access to our members only community where I hang out a lot, especially now that I'm not on social media. We decided from the beginning to make this an independent project. We don't have sponsors and we don't run ads. This means that we can make the show all about you and not what our sponsors or advertisers want. But it also means we're 100% reliant on your support. So my request and my invitation is simple. Support the show by becoming a member, or you can simply make a one-time donation of as little as $5. I cannot stress this enough. You can make a huge difference for as little as $5. Please head over to tmstpod.com right now. Tell Me Something True is engineered and mixed by Paul Chufo. Michael Elsesser and I dreamed up this show, and we're looking forward to joining you online and next time on Tell Me Something True. Mm-hmm.